Good evening, ladies. Welcome. We are winding down. Um, so Esther's been a um, just a blessing, right? Amen. Right? So and tonight, uh, more blessing. And I know that we're going to talk a little bit about Purim tonight and um, celebrating in remembering. And I was just reminded that um, we we're not to live in the past. But we're not to forget it either. We're to keep seeking things ahead and let go of what lies behind. But we're also reminded sometimes in scripture that you were once. And it's kind of a good thing to remember what we once were because it reminds us of the great deliverance that Jesus Christ provided for us. And so tonight I think we're going to probably hear a little bit about great deliverance. And so, and that is for us every day, his great deliverance. So let's pray and we'll dig in. Heavenly Father, we just bow before your throne of grace, thanking you for your great deliverance, thanking you for humbling yourself and stooping down so that you could be our great deliverer. We are <coughs> unworthy and undone and so grateful. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the lessons we've learned in this beautiful story of Esther, God and how you've pre preserved your people and your promises. And so, God, we just ask you to bless our sister Karen tonight um, as she teaches and brings uh, truth from your word to us tonight. And we ask also that you would prepare our hearts, open our ears and our hearts to hear and receive what you have, and um, that we would cooperate, come alongside, and respond as you would call us to. Father, we love you, and we look to honor you and bless you this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, ladies. All right, so tonight I want to start out our, our time tonight by introducing you to two friends of mine. This is Yosef right here, and he was drawn by my oldest daughter uh, several years ago. She's an artist. If you ever go up to the sketching pad, you'll meet her, and I think she's really talented, especially when it comes to character designs. And this guy here is a depiction of what she thought the man that lives in my head looks like. And he is the caretaker of the library that resides inside my brain. And so he has this big wooden desk, he's lots of papers stacked around, lots of stuff on his desk, and behind him are these huge, uh, big wooden shelves behind him filled with old dusty books and things, you know, big, tall, just very old looking. And um, so the kids used to say, when they ask me a question and I look at them like, wait, what? Like an algebra problem or the detail of something or a history fact or something like that when we were doing homeschooling. Um, and I would just go, wait a minute. And I had pause, and they're like, oh, Yosef is running down the, down the hall back there. <laughs> he's on his ladder, hiking up his skirt. He's climbing up the ladder and looking for the fact. And uh, this, is, this idea came about uh, way before the movie Inside Out. Um, but it's that same kind of that idea. Uh, but, uh, but my brain doesn't have, the, if you've seen that movie, it doesn't have the ball pit of lost memories. My brain has out. And Alf, like Alphabet, that's his pet goat. <laughs> and uh, he eats all the papers and chews up the little stuff. And he's constantly pulling up and, and chewing up stuff. So when the kids look at me and I go, I, I can't remember what you're talking about. And I go, oh, Alf ate that, right? And I'm like, yes, yes, he did. So this is the depiction of what goes on in my brain. And I think it's kind of a funny way to think about it when I try to remember something. And so... But the truth is that all of us have a great big library in our brains, right? We have one, and we're, if you were able to walk down, physically down the library of your brain, you could pull books off the shelf, and you might open one up and flip through the pages, and it might one might make you laugh out loud. There might be another one that kind of might stir a sense of longing maybe for days gone by. Or another might remind you of somebody who's not in your life anymore. Um, you might still, another one might bring tears or a sense of regret or a sense of maybe even resentment. And there are probably some books on the library of your shelf that you know exactly what's in those books, but you don't want to ever open those books again, right? And there's a lot of things that fill the library of our soul, and the truth is that a lot you're not the author of all of them. Uh, you know, sometimes the books on the shelves of our mind and in our hearts are written by others. 
were written, some with good intentions, some with careless intentions, and sometimes even evil or hostile intentions. And they write these things and they, we put them on the shelves and we leave them there. But no matter who authored the books that are in your heart, in your soul, in your mind, in the library there, you ultimately have editorial privilege. You have the ability to edit the content in those and change the way they are received and the impact they have on you and the people around you by extension. And so now we're in, 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 nearing the very end of our study of Esther. We have today and just one more. We'll be off for first and foremost next week. We'll, be, we'll come back on May 10th. But right now we're in the middle of chapter 9. And the last time we saw, when you were here, we saw that the Jews defended themselves against the, uh, the um, people who attacked them who were operating under Haman's law. And the Jews were still standing at the end of this. And that's not to say nobody died. In fact, we saw last time, if you were here, that over 75,000 people across the whole Persian Empire died during this couple of days that happened. Now, most of the story, time of the story of Esther ends with chapter 8. People don't feel like really to talk about what's in chapter 9. And chapter 10 just kind of skirt over the top of it. Um, and they like to, we like to finish with uh, Mordecai uh, issued a new law, and now everything's okay. But, so, but the Jews there, they, they, had to, they were attacked, and they had to defend themselves. So this was a bloody and difficult time when these two laws go into effect. Now, we tend, when we talk about uh, numbers as big as 75,000, we tend to make that really impersonal, like, oh, it's just a big group of people. But imagine if you were, for a minute, uh, a Jewish family that lived in some random city out there in the Persian Empire, not in the city of Susa, like, say, Egypt or somewhere. Now, this would be very far away from the capital city. And so uh, the dynamics of what is going on actually in the courtroom and these things are happening are pretty vague. You get uh, edicts handed down, but you don't know a lot about what's going on. It's not C no CNN, no headline news, no social media, so you don't know instant updates of everything that's happening. So officials of edicts come down, you read them, you just kind of kind of extrapolate what's going on, but you don't know a lot about it. So uh, you've heard about Haman's law, you've heard about Mordecai's law, and this day, set by Haman, comes and shows up and these people from your city from your city or the town that you live in they just show up and they come to attack your family right and so how does this this feel to you that you're you know you've got your kids here with you and these people come up and they're trying to kill you and everybody who lives in your household so in order to defend your, themselves your husband your father your brother your sons maybe they have to go out and defend your family, and this all unfolds on your front lawn. I mean, and they kill these people who come in. I mean, like, straight up kill them. I mean, how does that feel to you? That's a completely different feel than just a cold and personal number, right? So imagine how, uh, it, you know, about your kids, they're afraid, they can't sleep at night, they scream or cry at seeing what's happening here. We need to talk about, you know, PTSD here after seeing this all happen. And surely some Jewish people were wounded in the process. We don't have the details of that. But when you start to think about how this might have uh, felt to you, if you as you watch it unfold, it feels pretty different. And it's the difference between telling a teenager today what 9-11 was like but, but in, compared to somebody who was actually on the streets of New York. They're going to tell you a completely different story than just reading about it. Um, so... Uh, way different dynamic there. So in the wake of all this trauma, let's get to our verses for tonight. Verse 17 said, this happens on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th they rested it, rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. So the day Haman had set uh, in motion for the annihilation of the Jews has come and gone, and the Jews are still standing. If you remember back a couple of weeks ago, we talked and walked all the way through how God really unfolded all of these things and used the sleepless night of a king and a forgotten good deed by Mordecai to just bring about the complete reversal of everything planned by Haman. First, let's skip down to verse 20. It says that Mordecai recorded these events and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes near and far and to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar. 
at times when the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy, and their mourning was turned into a day of celebration. And if you skip on down to verse 23, so the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they had begun, doing what Mordecai had written to them. And 20, uh, 24 is kind of a summation of everything we've been learning about through the whole book. For Haman, son, son of Hamadatha the Agai, the enemy of all the Jews has plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the purr, that is the lot, for their ruin and destruction. And so what was this day of celebration that Mordecai, the edict he, he um, put into effect? What did he call it? Not Queen Esther Day, not Deliverance Today, not Mordecai Memorial. What he called it was, when the plot, uh, he, he, Haman devised it, sorry, <laughs> next, next verse, 26. Therefore, these days were called Purim from the word Pur, because of everything written in this letter and because of what they had seen and what had happened to them. Verse 28 says, and these days of Purim should never cease to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of them die out among their descendants. So what is it called? It's called Purim. Because before this decree now, Purim, or the Pur, wasn't a day of celebration. It was actually a literal thing. We talked about this way back in chapter 3 a little bit. Purim were dice, and this is kind of what it looked right here. Very similar to the shape of the kind of dice that we have today, <coughs> but a lot more writing on them, as you can see here. Uh, but back then, they weren't for gaming like we use today. They were for divination. They used them to roll these dice to consult the gods and try to find out what they should do based on what the favor that the gods would give them. It doesn't have to be an evil plot like what Haman did here. It, it, it could be that they wanted to pick the best day to start a military campaign or to when to plant crops or when um, they wanted to go on a journey of some kind. So in this case, of course, we know from going through this whole book here is that it was the instrument that the Haman used to seal the fate of the Jews' death. And so the so-called gods had picked out the day of their destruction but really, we, as we found out over the last couple of chapters, is that God had the last word. Instead of annihilation, this was turned into a day of celebration, a complete reversal of what Haman had plotted. They called it Purim because it was a testimony to the power of God to undo even the most dire-looking situation. The fate of the gods or Satan or of the world system or political powers or whoever it was, the whims of the leader, had no say in what happened to God's people then or now. Okay, and we'll talk about why Purim matters for our day, for us as believers in Jesus, in our wrap-up session in a couple of weeks. But for now, I want to talk about specifically why the name Purim is significant and what the application is for chapter 9, and that is the power of a directed change of focus can be an immensely wonderful tool to reclaim what was meant for our destruction by our enemy. That is, you know, we can we, are, we know that we're supposed to apply our faith, our faith forward to look at situations where we don't know what's going to happen and there's uncertainty in our future. We also know that we can apply our faith right now in situations that are unfolding to, right now in our lives, but we can also take our faith and apply it backwards to things that have already happened to us. And that has a real big power of how it changes that effect on our lives, no matter what has happened to us. Now, it could have been really, really easy for those Jews to have wanted to forget about these two days uh, this, this bloody bloodbath that happens here all together and not think about even the whole year at all, I mean, because it was filled with so much stress and anxiety over laws being passed down and what's going to happen to us and all this kind of stuff. I mean, you would think after this is over, they'd just want to be like, I don't want to think about that anymore at all. But Mordecai had the wisdom, no doubt from God, to make it a legal decree, a legal declaration to uh, celebrate this every year and to call it Purim. That's because he, it changed the focus of the 13th day of the month of Adar from a day that brought back bad memories 
to one that celebrated the goodness and the deliverance of God. By calling it Purim, it highlighted the fact that their fate was not sealed by a roll of the dice, but reminded them that their fate was then, is now, and always will be in the hand of God. So eventually, it changed the meaning of the word altogether. The word Purim or Pur doesn't mean dice anymore. It is specifically and wholly tied to this story. So if you said something about Purim, there, people are not going to get confused that you're talking about, like, you know, are you going to roll dice to play a game or to, to seek the gods? They're going to think about this story because it's now connected wholly to that. And um, because now it's, this word Purim is synonymous with the deliverance and rescue of God, of his people, Israel, at this time. So, when we learn to look at the events of our lives in light of the sovereignty of God, they take on new meaning. Now, this is what I want to kind of talk about the rest of the time tonight. And we already know how this worked for the Jews in Persia. We've been over this multiple times. But I want to show you a couple more examples from the scripture that teach us the same thing, okay? One less familiar, one more familiar that, that most of us all know th that story, but they all give us the same lesson as we see in this part of the book of Esther. So you know Jacob from the book of Genesis, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, he had brother Esau, you know about the story about him stealing the birthright, and um, he is the father of the 12 sons of Israel, uh, he's father, father of the 12 boys who became the 12 tribes of Israel. And you remember that he had two wives, right? He loved Rachel. When he first uh, ran away from Esau after the whole conflict about the birthright, he ran away, saw Rachel, fell in love with her, and then worked seven years for uh, her hand. And, you know, remember the wedding night thing where they did the big switcheroo there, and he <laughs> they ended up giving uh, Leah to him instead of Rachel, and he wakes up after a, a week of... Uh, wedding week partying <laughs> and he's going wait what happened here <laughs> and so he ended up working another seven years so he could be married to Rachel too and so this is uh, uh, later on uh, the story I want to talk about uh, for a minute is that uh, this is after they're leaving to come back to their homeland she is pregnant she's already had uh, Joseph uh, the older the older boy and she's pregnant the second time and so they're traveling back, and they get to chapter 35, tells us that they, when they moved on from Bethel, while they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had a great deal of difficulty. Now she was having great difficulty in childbirth. The midwife said to her, don't be afraid, for you will have another son. Now this is supposed to be a really great day for Jacob, right? Another child, we find out it's his son by his beloved uh, wife. Rachel, but in the process, tragedy strikes. She has trouble, probably hemorrhages here, but, uh, and then she says in verse 18, she says, as she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Benoni. Now, if you get the idea of what's going on here, we need to know what Benoni means, because names were really important, and people named their kids a lot of times based on events that were happening right then, so she named uh, her son, Ben-Oni, and Ben always means son of. So Ben-Oni means son of my sorrow. Now that's a pretty good name if you're going to pick what's happening right here uh, at the moment, right? Even Jacob would re agree, I'm sure. Yes, another son by my beloved wife, but what cost, right? He lost his girlfriend, his love, and, and just as an aside, the Bible doesn't ever say that Jacob loves God, but it does say he loves Rachel. So this is a huge tragedy for him. Great sorrow. Good name if you're just going to pick based on what's happening right now. We'll look at the last part of verse 18. It says, she named her son Benoni, but his father named him Benjamin. Right? So we know what Benoni means. To understand uh, the name change here, what is significant, we need to know what Benjamin means. Right? So once again, Ben means son of, or Benjamin, or Yamin, as the Hebrew would be, means son of my right hand. So Benjamin means son of my right hand. In the Old Testament, your right hand, the right hand of the Father, is the hand of blessing, strength, 
honor, those kinds of things. And so when a man or a father wanted to bless his child, he took his right hand, put on the boy's head, and then spoke a blessing over him. So what Jacob was saying here is that this child who was born in sorrow and pain and grief and loss is really the son of blessing, strength, and honor. But he refused to name that child's future based on a moment in the child's past. Okay? Jacob is looking at tragedy here. He's looking at loss. He's looking at pain. He's looking at despair here. But he did not label that child that way. He decided that what was really sorrow, the loss of his precious Rachel here, could be called something different. Right? And he chose deliberately to call that boy, not what was based on what he saw right here in this moment and experienced at this moment in time, but what was seen through the sovereign hand of God. This is what we must learn to do, ladies. You don't get to choose what's happening in your life. You don't get to choose what comes into it or what people pour into your life or what happens by tragedy. You don't get to pick those things. There are some things that come into our lives that are rightfully called sorrow. They're called pain. They're called suffering. Yes, that's the right name. If we were going to pick something based on what we see here horizontally, yeah, that's what I pick. Because that's what it is, right? It's, but, for, but when we're from our vantage point and when we are blinded by a confusion and pain, that's sometimes we, all we can see, right? If we not, but if we aren't really careful, our labels end up staying with us for a lifetime. Yes, the things that happen to you do bring sadness. They do bring hurt. They do bring brokenness. But you don't have to stick with the name the world gives them. You have the right to rename it based on the sovereignty of God. See, Rachel wasn't wrong, was she? It was sorrow. She did die. Jacob did lose his best girl. But if you just call it what it looks like on the surface... That, that takes absolutely no faith at all. That's what the world does, right? I mean, losing a spouse or a parent or a child is sad. It hurts. And sometimes this separation is awful. These things are terrible. They wrench us apart. Life can be really hard sometimes. And not just as, as it relates to death like in this story. It is hard when you can't find a job. Or it is hard when, when the job you have doesn't provide for you. Uh, or you have struggles there that you just can't hardly even explain to people. You might struggle with health. That does grab your attention, but it doesn't have to keep it. You can choose to set your mind on things above, not on earthly things like Colossians chapter 3 tells us. You can be like Jacob, like Mordecai, who looked at a bad situation and decided not to call it sorrow, but to call it strength, not to call it faith call it deliverance. Okay, the other example comes from uh, Jacob's other son, Joseph. Most of us know him. This is the, the first son by Rachel. And uh, most of the back half of the book of Genesis is all about the unfolding of his life. And you probably know the details. If you went to Sunday school when you were little, you saw this on a flannel board where they moved the little people around and tell us that. Um, but uh, his, he was the favorite son of Jacob. Uh, you know the coat of many colors, right? And that was such a problem to him, uh, for in Joseph's life that his brothers hated him to the point where they plotted to kill him. And only at the last moment, they were going to throw him in a pit and leave him there to die. But then they decided better of that. They didn't want blood on their hands, so they sold him into slavery. And off he went to Egypt. And he spent 13 years as a slave or in prison and um, now sometimes we kind of like to gloss over that part, right? And we think, you know, how hard could it have really been because, you know, he forgave them because if it had been really hard and it had been a really bad situation, then, you know, maybe you wouldn't have forgiven them because probably we wouldn't have, right? <laughs> I mean, we'd have held it against them. But just so you know, this was real prison and real Egyptian, uh, real Egyptian prison. Um, uh, Psalm 105, verse uh, 17 and 18 says, he sent a man before them, that is Joseph, sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles, and his neck was put in iron. So he really did go to prison. He was really sold, really in a dungeon, 
real chains, and you can imagine what an Egyptian prison might have been like. I mean, it's like really hot over there, and um, not a lot of exercise time, basketball, no cable television. It was probably really, really hard, and um, yet we don't ever see anger, resentment, or hostility in Joseph. Not at all, ever. In fact, here's what he does say, and this is the moment when he reveals himself to his brothers in Genesis 45. Don't you know these men were really shocked? In fact, the first thing Joseph says to them is don't be angry, don't be upset, because this is going to be really fearful, right? I mean, I wish we had some of the aside stuff that they said to each other at these moments. Uh, but he's lo they're looking at the man who's in charge of all of Egypt here, and they just found out he's the brother that you got, tried to kill and then sold into, as slavery, uh, into slavery and just tossed him aside for a handful of silver. And here's what he says. Now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve your life. So was he really sold? Yep, he was. Did he endure the pain of imprisonment? We just saw it in the Psalms. Yes, 100%. That's accurate. Was the suffering directly because of what they did? Absolutely, 100%. You know it was. Is that all of those things are true, but does he look at his life and focus on that one part of his story uh, that was the start of all his difficulty? No, he doesn't. What he says is, you sold me here, but God sent me here. You see what he did there? He re redefined his whole backstory through the lens, the sovereignty of God. All of it. The betrayal, the slavery, the false accusations, the prisons, the hurt, the, the desperation. Not sold. Sent. Okay? Was it their fault? Yes, it was. Totally guilty. Did they do something terrible to him? Absolutely they did. They stood and they bargained with strangers for the life of their brother. They did not care about him. They wanted to get rid of him. And so they hatched the plot and they executed and they went back home and covered it up. But above all of that evil intent, all of that carelessness, God ruled in his life. And the last word in Joseph's life was not the will of his brothers. God transformed it. What's up? How do you see your history? Are you sold? Or are you sent? Are you sold by cancer, uh, degeneration, or some infirmity? Or are you sent by God to be a beacon of hope in a hospital, a rehab clinic, a doctor's office? Have you made your, your past son of my sorrow or son of my right hand? Have you made it betrayal, vindictiveness, or whatever words you want to call the actions of other Christians, co-workers, family? Or have you made an opportunity to demonstrate what real forgiveness looks like? Is it a roll of the dice? Or is it the plan of God? Have the fates landed you in loss and heartache and struggle and emptiness? Or is it the plan of God for you to be a real life example of someone who trusts God even when you don't understand? Oh, my God. 
you haven't heard a long time ago, but it's a great summary of this whole idea, so I'm stealing it from her. Uh, it says, you don't get to decide what goes in the story you have, but you do get to choose the headline. Mm -hmm. Think of that. You don't get to know what, what you know, we all pick things that we wouldn't want to be in our story, but we don't get to pick that. But we do get to choose what headline goes to our so what do you call? What's happened to you? <laughs> well, how have you made it? Can you look at the past of uh, the pain and the confusion and can you pick a new name? One that factors in the sovereign hand of God and is rooted in his truth? This is what we have to do. Who has this final say in your life? Is it the roll of dice? Is it God? And you might think, well, you know what? I would love to rename my pain and my past and my hurt and my confusion. I don't really know what to call it. I don't really know it. Well, I'll give you a place to start. If you were uh, here a, a year ago, we were studying the book of James. Uh, I'll just briefly go over a little bit of, from the first chapter there. Because if you don't know anything else that God is up to in the circumstances that happen in your life, we can at least know this is a, a this is what he's up to. And you see in verse 3 and 4 of James 1, it says, you know that the pain of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may mature, be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So you can rename sorrow and hurt and pain. You can rename it perseverance, right? You're still here. You're still moving on. God's still working in your life. You're still seeking him. The fact that you sit in this room tonight could be a thousand other places tonight, but you're here trying to find and hear of God, understanding his word, you're still standing. So whatever's come in your life isn't defeat, perseverance, okay? It's also maturity, maturity, not loss, not brokenness or damage or failure. Even when you fall, get back up. Keep moving. Confess, repent, and here's the big deal here. Accept God's pardon and move on. Okay? Don't wallow in your mistakes forever. If you make mistakes, people does stuff for you. The enemy is the accuser, not God. He does not accuse us. He pardons us. And so uh, he calls us to repentance. But once we have chosen to repent, confess and repent. Now, repent means change behavior, right? It's not just saying words. It means I've changed. I've left this behind, and I'm moving in a different direction. But once that has happened, it's time to move on. Move on in perseverance and toward maturity. And not lack, what's still happening? Completion. Completion, right? That's a great reminder uh, uh, that God is moving us toward something that can be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And I love uh, the promise of Philippians 1 6. He who began the good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. Jesus. And that's a great reminder that when we feel hopelessly stuck in the same cycle, we're going over and over the stuff again and again, and we might feel like nothing is productive is happening in our lives right now, but God promises that, that He's at work, right? And when we, even when we can't see anything going on, remember all the way back to chapter 1 when we were studying about the elder, right? The big takeaway was what? God is always at work, right? That's the big thing to remember. And the overarching lesson from the book of Esther is that he is always work. He's always at work. Even when we can't see him, even when he's off in the shadows, we can trust that he is up to something. And so when you don't understand, you feel frustrated, you can't see anything beneficial happening, you're taking tiny little baby steps, two step forward, one step back, and you feel like, I can't anymore. Tell yourself this truth. God is always at work. He never gives up. He is not frustrated by you. He's not constantly looking back at, it, at your life and going, yeah, look at that thing she did. Uh, oh, here we are again. We're going round and round and round the circle again. 
complicated. It, you know, I can't expect forgiveness. Um, and that's not true. It sounds like humility, but it is an expression of pride and arrogance. Okay? God offers a sacrifice for sin, all sin, through Jesus Christ. Forgiveness is full and complete. You're not an exception. You're covered under the blood of Jesus. If you're accepting him as your Savior, you don't have to keep doing penance for things that have been repented of. Accept what yours is what is yours in Christ and move on into righteousness and holiness and commitment to follow him. God is always at work. Be patient. Be faithful. Press on. Don't call your situation what it looks like from a horizontal perspective. Be lifted up. Look at it from the vantage point of scripture and give it a new name. Okay? And so the application for this section of scripture is, uh, of, of this section of Esther is a practical homework assignment. Because I want you to go home. And I want you to do it soon. I want you to look across the landscape of your life. And I want you to pick a sorrowful situation. I want you to pick a painful moment. I want you to pick something that just sticks with you and plays over and over and over again in your heart. I want you to look back at your life. Find a situation that has been named horizontally what the world would tell you it is. And the thing that you have carried with you maybe for your whole life, 5, 10, 15, 20 30 years you've been carrying this. So you're wearing a label that other people have given you, and it's called lost, broken, victim, weak, not enough, unable, failure, oppressed, whatever you have carried, whatever label that you're wearing over these things, maybe for years and years, I want you to do what Jacob, and Joseph, and Mordecai did. That is ringing the court of sovereignty of God. And so we're going to end where we started back at the end of this section in verse 28. These days of Purim should never cease to be celebrated by the Jews, or should be the or more should the memory of them die out among their descendants. And so whatever happened to you, whatever you remember, whatever stuck there, whatever label there is, rename it, ladies. God has the final word on that. See your pain and your struggle through. His sovereignty. He has a plan for it. And he wants to use it. And what he wants to use it for is for your transformation and for his glory. His glory, okay? And then, when you do that, don't tell somebody else. And don't let the memory of what God has done die out among your descendants. Amen, ladies? Amen. Amen. God, we just thank you for the wonderful truths of Esther and the wonderful truths of your whole Bible that teach us that there's more to what's going on in life than what's on the surface. God, we just thank you. We're so humbly thank you that you don't ever give up on us, that you have more going on in our lives, more going on in the world, more going on wherever we go and whatever we do that we can understand. But God, we trust you. We trust you. We believe you. And we want to walk out in faith. And, and, and be instruments of bringing the gospel and your grace to those who don't know. God, use whatever it is in our lives, whatever it is that, that we, we struggle with. God, help us to rename it. Help us to rename it according to what your work is in our lives. And we trust you. And we lean on your son, the strong son of God. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.